Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome to the UCLA faculty and students here in person with me and to our speakers and to our audience joining us remotely. My name is Kate McIntosh. I'm the executive director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights here at UCLA School of Law. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge our presence here at UCLA on the traditional, ancestral and unceded land of the Gabrielino Tongva people. So Ukraine, uh, we've all been watching with horror as Russia's invaded Ukraine in clear violation of the international law prohibition on the use of force set out in the UN Charter. Reports of the ongoing military operations include attacks on the government buildings in Kharkiv, reports of civilian casualties, the use of indiscriminate weapons, and currently a 40 mile long military convoy advancing on the capital of Kyiv. Meanwhile, Ukrainian websites were defaced and taken offline and data wiping malware was unleashed on government systems in what appeared to be cyber war crimes. On Sunday, Ukraine submitted an application to the International Court of Justice under the Genocide Convention, arguing that Russia must be held accountable for manipulating the notion of genocide to justify aggression. And yesterday, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court announced that he will seek authorization to open an investigation into the situation in Ukraine, where the court has jurisdiction further to a declaration made by Ukraine under Article 12.3 of the statute. Meanwhile, Ukrainians are leaving the country in vast numbers and being largely welcomed by neighboring European countries. This is one bright spot in a terrible situation, but it also throws into relief the racism of border policies, which are right now denying entry to non-European refugees trying to flee Ukraine. And the stark contrast with the scenes of Syrian, Afghan and other refugees from the global south who were trapped in the snow at the Hungarian border last autumn. So a lot going on in fact and in law, and I'm honored to be joined today by our panelists to help us make sense of this situation. So first up is Svetlana Zalishchuk, politician, journalist, human rights activist, and member of the Ukrainian parliament until 2019. We'll then hear from Wayne Jordash, international criminal lawyer who has been living and working in Ukraine for a number of years. Svetlana and Wayne are joining us from Ukraine. They've been forced to leave Kyiv and are currently at the Hungarian border. So I'm going to start with Svetlana and Wayne and introduce our other two panelists after that. So Svetlana, first of all, thank you so much uh, for making time to join us in the midst of uh, this terrible situation and everything you must be going through. Can I ask you to tell us about where you are now and what's going on around you? So at the moment, uh, I'm uh, in a small town called Berehovo. It's three kilometers from uh, Hungary, but uh, still Ukraine. Uh, we left Kyiv. Uh, on the first day of the war, uh, we woke up at five o'clock in the morning in, in the downtown uh, to the eight explosions that we've heard. Uh, and you know, we live in the, in the very center, just uh, around the oldest church in that part of the world, actually. And usually we wake up to the bells of the churches, not the blasts. Uh, around my city. Uh, now, so we decided to leave that day. We didn't feel safe. We understood that uh, Putin's plan was to encircle Kyiv. And uh, uh, we understand that at some point the window to leave the city will be narrowing and the supplies of the food can be cut. Uh, and we see now that many roads are blocked indeed and the bridges have been, um, have been destroyed. Uh, and uh, there are already, they, today, uh, they uh, hit, launched two, missile, two missiles on the uh, TV tower that sends the, the signal of the TV channels that population can uh, watch what's going on. Uh, so it was completely destroyed. However, later on, the connection has been uh, recovered, but we've seen this, uh, you know, a massive explosion in the center of my of the of the capital of the country uh, and is just horrifying can you tell us what you're most concerned about right now that's happening yes so um well I, i'd like to give a definition of what's going on first of all and uh, i would use four words what's happening now in ukraine it's unbelievable unjustifiable it's 
unexplainable and unforgivable. Uh, that would be my qualification. And I know that later on uh, we have lawyers here and they will put all the events that happen now in Ukraine in the legal context and will explain it from a legal point of view. But I want to say as a, as a Ukrainian citizen and also a, a human being that what's happening now is a total evil. evil. It's a terror of an unseen scale and uh, uh, cruelty uh, in Europe. I would say even that it's actually insanity. You know, we were informed that it might happen because the media and intelligence and inter international leader were talking already for a while that Putin is preparing it. We were witnessing this amassment of the Russian troops around Ukrainian borders, uh, but at the same time, we still couldn't believe it. And despite the fact that just prior to when we left Kyiv, we knew that it might happen uh, in the morning. We still went to bed. We didn't leave our hometown because we thought, well, this is the 21st century. This is Europe. This is, you know, uh, it's just, it's, it can't happen as it predicted. Uh, so, uh, but it did, you know, and uh, uh, now what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm worried about, first of all, I'm worried about that Putin will not stop. Obviously, he uh, said in his speech prior to the invasion that he hates Ukrainians. He doesn't believe in Ukrainian as a state. He denies us the right for the independence and the, for the sovereignty. And he obviously hoped that his uh, invasion will be like a, a victorious war, uh, which would take maybe two days to conquer Kyiv capital. But it turned out to be a humiliation for him and international isolation and the loss of authority uh, around the world, but also slowly he is losing his authority in Russia itself too. At the same time, despite the fact of, despite the, these developments, I feel that it makes him even more dangerous because he's trapped in a way. Uh, you know, in 2014, when we had our Euromaidan, the Revolution of Dignity, and we ousted our corrupt president, former president Yanukovych, he ran away to Moscow. Moscow, Putin gave him uh, a shelter, the political shelter. Putin doesn't have anywhere to run. So I feel that he, he wants to put Ukraine on the knees. He will not stop in front of any means to destroy my city and my country. What we're witnessing now, uh, it's a massive shelling of civilian areas. Uh, we already have more, uh, more than 16 kids have been killed. Several hundreds people uh, have been killed. Many uh, houses uh, have been destroyed. Uh, some, some cities, some small towns in the east of the country are just crumbled to dust. There is a proper humanitarian crisis. People are sitting for six days in their cellars, in their shelters, without water, food, uh, light, uh, and electricity. Uh, so this is my concern number one, that, that he will not stop. My concern number two, that despite the fact that uh, during the last couple of days we've seen pretty strong international both unity and response. It's a hellish package of hellish sanctions against Putin himself, banks, uh, some oligarchs, uh, some enterprises in Russia. But we also understand that these sanctions will not stop him. It won't. And we still keep on uh, uh, receiving this today it was 400 missiles launched on uh, peaceful cities of ukraine so i'm concerned that we to a certain extent on the military level we're left alone and of course our army uh, is extremely courageous the president today is backed with a very strong uh, courageous army but at the same time of course putin has an advantage uh, in front of ukraine in numbers uh, and in the military equipment as well. And we are receiving some weapons, some military help from uh, European countries, other democratic countries in the world. However, this answer, unfortunately, was delayed. Ukraine was asking uh, for, for the weapon during the last couple of months. 
but for a number of different reasons, uh, the international community refused to give us this weapon. And now, even from logistical point of view, it's very difficult to deliver it because Ukraine is in no fly zone. So Ukraine is asking the international community to protect our skies, to use its military uh, capacity uh, to close the skies from the missiles, from Russian missiles, to, to defend uh, our skies as a, uh, as a partner, as a NATO partner and as a, a EU partner. So these two main things, I would say, are my main concerns. Thank you so much, Svetlana. I want to move to Wayne uh, Jordash. Um, Wayne, you've been engaged with Ukraine um, as a lawyer for a number of years. Could you put this current uh, series of attacks, the current invasion, into some context over what's been happening between Russia and Ukraine for the past few years? Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Kate, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, well, first of all, as uh, Svetlana mentioned, in 2014, there was effectively a revolution where the Ukrainian people ousted um, the uh, Yanukovych, the president. Thereafter, uh, Yanukovych's government, uh, I should say just before, um, killed uh, over 100 people, sent out militia into the streets to beat up and forcibly um, disappear the protesters. And thereafter, Russia moved into Crimea, first of all, pretending that that it, um, the Crimean people who were exercising some kind of uh, and occupied the uh, part of the, the Crimean peninsula. And thereafter, Russia agitated in the east uh, to uh, ensure uh, that uh, certain uh, Russian speakers uh, were armed and uh, essentially started to fight against the central government in Ukraine. Um, thereafter, um, in the East, uh, Russia, and this is one of the common misconceptions, Russia not only supplied the uh, non-state armed groups uh, in the East of Ukraine, but effectively started to control them and, and had overall, has had overall control of them since 2014, including uh, everything from financial support, uh, from uh, weapons support, and even sending in uh, Russian military to lead the armed groups uh, and uh, ensure that they did uh, Russia's bidding. All the while, Russia pretending that it was uh, simply an honest broker at Minsk, the uh, place where the peace talks were supposed to or have been taking part uh, taking place and Russia pretended to be the honest broker um, trying to uh, resolve a conflict between parts of the Ukrainian uh, society those in the east and, and the rest of the country which is a complete fiction so um, in effect in 2014 Russia invaded Crimea invaded the east and this uh, latest invasion is just more of the same. Russia, having failed to achieve its objectives in 2014 and 2015, uh, we, and its objective was effectively to try to control Ukraine, and it, it, Russia and Putin will mention the failure of uh, Ukraine to implement the Minsk Agreement, but the Minsk Agreement, as the Russians interpret it, effectively would give the uh, separatists a veto over the Ukrainian government. And that's what the Putin's plan has been all along. So he can control Ukraine through the politics and through military aggression. That having failed, he's now um, determined uh, through this latest invasion to exercise uh, um, control pure, uh, purely by domination. I should say, add, add one thing. He does seem to be under an illusion that somehow um, he would be regarded as a liberator. And I queried whether he really believed that until recently. And I think he, he did believe that until uh, recently. Um, somehow he's got it into his head that um, Ukraine belongs to Russia and that people want, uh, people in Ukraine want Russia to control uh, Ukraine. It couldn't be further from the truth, but that, that's his uh, latest, um, 
the, 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 the recent invasion is really a, 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 a recognition that he believed that was the case. And now he's coming to the conclusion as he must, as the Ukrainian army resist and the Ukrainian people resist. Uh, that unfortunately he has to dominate and control and um, kill in order to achieve his aims. Thank you. Thank you for that, Wayne, for that context. I think that's that's really helpful. I'm going to turn to our other two experts now because um, I want to make sure we get to questions so that I'm sure all the, everyone in the audience has a lot they'd love to hear from you. So we have uh, Richard Dicker, founding International Justice Director of Human Rights Watch, and Lindsay Freeman, Technology, Law and Policy Director of UC Berkeley's Human Rights Centre with us. And again, their full bios will be post posted in the Zoom chat. Richard, if I could turn to you. So Human Rights Watch has been reporting on international crimes being committed in the Ukraine, over which the International Criminal Court might have jurisdiction. Can you tell us some more about those? i um, certainly glad to uh, talk about what we have found. Um, uh, and I want to focus on um, Article 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, uh, which encompasses war crimes um, that come within the court's jurisdiction. Um, I'm doing that uh, because uh, the recently adopted crime of aggression, uh, which entered into force in 2018 uh, and in many ways captures uh, the criminality uh, involved in this invasion. Uh, is not applicable in this situation, as uh, the ICC prosecutor himself indicated in a statement uh, just the other day. Neither Russia nor Ukraine are state parties to this statute, and because of that fact, the crime of aggression is not applicable here. Uh, what is applicable, certainly, uh, is Article 8 that deals with war crimes in international armed conflicts. And I'm going to focus in particular on serious violations of the laws and customs of war, uh, which are contained in Article 8, paragraph to subparagraph B um, of the Rome Statute. And just to give you a sense, uh, this uh, provision criminalizes it intentionally directing attacks against the civilian population, intentionally directing attacks against civilian objects, intentionally launching an attack in the knowledge that such attack will cause loss of life or injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects. Um, I, I cite these provisions mindful of what Svetlana mentioned a moment ago about 400 missiles being fired, many of which landing on civilian areas in uh, Ukraine. Um, and within this uh, uh, frame of indiscriminate attacks, I want to highlight the use of cluster munitions uh, that have increasingly uh, been mentioned in media reports uh, coming out of Ukraine. Um, these munitions typically explode in the air and send dozens, even hundreds of small bomblets over the, uh, an area the size of a football field. Uh, cluster submunitions often fail to explode on initial impact, leaving remains that act like uh, landmines. 
we have documented in an attack just outside a hospital uh, in eastern Ukraine, uh, the use of munitions, cluster munitions that killed a number of civilians um, that we confirmed by interviews with a doctor at the hospital and a local medical official in the region. These cluster munitions uh, that we were quoted today as, as being used are indiscriminate in their effect on civilians, uh, would, if proven, prove to be a war crime under the Rome Statute, uh, um, and that will be the task of the ICC prosecutor. Uh, the accounts of cluster munition usage uh, are increasing uh, as every day passes, and we are deeply concerned. Thank you very much, Richard. I'm going to pause now and gather some questions, uh, particularly because Svetlana is going to have to leave us. She has another interview she'll be doing. If anybody in the room has a question, please um, raise your hand, uh, specifically one that you'd like to ask Svetlana. So maybe I'll start with, do you want to start with your question, Jess? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering if Svetlana could tell us a little bit about what the refugee situation is like on the ground and those trying to flee the country. So that was a question about whether, Svetlana, you could tell us a little about what the refugee situation looks like for those trying to flee the country. Maybe we'll start with that one. Yes, so, um, well, since the first day, uh, people started to leave the capital, uh, but uh, within the, uh, well, afterwards, uh, the wave of those who started to flee their cities, their towns, and the country uh, is getting increased. So at the moment, we have data that approximately up to 500,000 people left Ukraine, and uh, we have we personally like uh, were driving uh, almost uh, two days, 48 hours to the west of Ukraine. And usually it takes like uh, seven hours to drive that road because the roads are completely packed, uh, packed with the cars. And on the borders, on the checkpoints between uh, Ukraine and our Western neighbors like Poland, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, uh, it's uh, it's really difficult situation. So people stand sometimes for a couple of days in order to cross the border. And people leave uh, without even having an idea of where we, uh, they're going to go. So they just try to leave because they feel that their children, uh, their grandparents are not in safety. Uh, and uh, so they, they cross the border and then they try to find uh, where they can stay. So the situation is pretty dramatic. Also, I'd like to say that there is already a problem with uh, humanitarian aid, with food, with food and medicine, especially in those towns and those cities that have been already surrounded and uh, the access to which have been blocked because of the uh, military, in, because of the troops around those cities. So our prime minister, Ukrainian prime minister, called uh, the international community to help us with uh, those delivery of the food and medicine. Thanks so much, uh, Svetlana. I have another question from the room. Yeah, yeah I, I had a question about the negotiations which have been going on, which started two days ago. And the question is basically whether you expect that these negotiations, negotiations will lead to anything, specifically a ceasefire. And whether you think that there might be a point that the cost of fighting it will be higher than the cost of surrender. So whether you think the negotiations currently underway have a chance of success and whether they might lead to a ceasefire and whether at some point the cost of fighting might outweigh the cost of surrender for the Ukrainian side, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your question. So uh, I'll be honest with you that I think that no one knows really uh, what is happening there with the negotiations. This information is uh, 
not uh, really disclosed. So there is a certain secrecy around it. Um, we know that after the first round of the negotiations, uh, the only tangible result is that they agreed to negotiate further. Uh, personally, well, I, I want to say that Ukraine always insisted on diplomacy, uh, but we also define diplomacy as a dialogue and not uh, surrender. Uh, because what Putin wants, uh, Putin wanted Ukraine to give up on its sovereignty and territorial integrity, basically. And I think it is unacceptable, neither for Ukraine, nor for shouldn't be, nor for the international community, that one person can just redraw the borders of one country, just a smaller country with a smaller army uh, in the 21st century. It's just unacceptable. So, and of course, um, what's happening now and what's going to happen? I think that uh, many people, pe me personally, I'm quite skeptical uh, about these negotiations because it's obviously that Putin demands uh, things that are just cannot be accepted. I'll remind you that he demanded the security guarantees for, for Russia, uh, that he believed that uh, current government of Ukraine, it's Nazi government, despite the fact that, uh, once again, our president is a Jew, you know. Uh, he uh, also, Putin uh, demands Crimea to be recognized as part of the Russian uh, Federation, which is once again, uh, it's unacceptable. Uh, it was part of Ukraine and we will not refuse from our land and from, from, from our people. So I personally do not see uh, really the, uh, the, compromising perspective, the things that Putin demand cannot be fulfilled, you know, by, uh, by Zelensky. So it seems to me that it's going to be a really uh, deadlock in that direction. But how the situation would develop on the ground, you're right that if Putin will go completely crazy and will start just bomb the civilian to the extent that thousands and hundreds of thousands of people will, uh, will, be, uh, will be killed, uh, then, of course, I, I think that the price uh, that our leadership will be ready to pay uh, will be under the question. But it also depends on the response of the international community and whether uh, today our appeal will be heard and uh, whether, for example, uh, international community will agree to close the skies for Russian missiles. Thank you very much. I'm going to just uh, put one more question from the um, somebody, uh, Nick Levson, who's participating by Zoom, uh, who asked, how should we think about putting pressure on the general Russian population, especially through divestment actions like stopping Google Pay and Apple Pay, which further make Russian citizens dependent upon the Russian state? I don't know if you, Svetlana, or anybody else would like to um, share some thoughts on that question. I'm happy to start if, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to dominate the whole uh, conversation, but uh, in short, uh, it's a very good question, to be honest, because in my mind, if something can really stop Putin, it's not sanctions. He is not personally afraid of sanctions. I, I don't think so. Uh, but it's people, it's his people. If Russians in millions, angry millions, will go into the streets and start, start protests against his own leader and will start demand Putin to stop the war, I think this is where, uh, where he can, can be stopped. So this impact on the Russian society, that they start to question what Putin is doing, why do we have to pay for this war, uh, in my mind, is a, is a right direction. Thank you. And Svilana, I might ask you one more question because I know you have to go. Uh, so I have a question specifically for you and it perhaps give you an opportunity to also sum up the points you've been making for us today. Uh, this is from Anne Karagosian who asks, given the current state of this horrifying crisis, what specifically would be your hope for a practical solution in ending this war as soon as possible? militarily, diplomatically, or otherwise? Well, it's a difficult question because, you know, um, so six days ago, 
Ukraine was a peaceful country. We didn't threat anyone. We didn't attack anyone. Uh, we didn't claim anyone's land. Uh, we didn't try to uh, curse any of our neighbors uh, to do something. So uh, a just solution to this is to make Putin stop this war, uh, to stop, to, to, to achieve a ceasefire and to make them, to pay the price for everything he, uh, he did. He has to be prosecuted uh, at the, without a doubt, at the, in the International Criminal Court. I have no doubt that in, in the future, Putin will be uh, a, a character of the Nuremberg of our century. Uh, so this is, as I see it, this is the only way uh, this, this scenario can develop. Uh, I cannot uh, imagine a situation when the whole world will be just watching of how our country will be defeated and what our independent, uh, democratically elected government uh, will be just killed because this is what has been uh, already impressed that Putin sent these uh, killing um, squads, Chechen squads to kill our president and the leaders of our government. And then it will be well, what substituted and uh, Ukrainians will never accept that. We have uh, 40 million of people who are hating, literally hating uh, Russian regime for killing our children. So I cannot imagine uh, another scenario uh, for, for Ukraine. It's just, it's just not going to happen. I don't know whether I answered your question uh, because I'm emotional and I'm answering it as a of course, as a human being, as a citizen, so uh, maybe it's not gives you a, a lot in terms of how diplomatically or militarily can can be solved. But I do think that if today we unite our forces with the international community and really hit Putin back on all of the fronts, we are really able to put him to uh, uh, get him out of our country and to bring him back to Russia. And he can be also, he, it can be the beginning of his end. His regime will fall if we have enough strength to stand up together to him. Lana, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today. I'd like thank to you so much. I appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All the, all the best from us. Okay, I'd like to change gear a little bit then and move on to our, uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Lindsay Freeman, who I also mentioned already is the Technology, Law and Policy Director at UC Berkeley's Human Rights Centre. So Lindsay, you're an expert on digital technologies. Can you talk about whether the cyber operations that we're seeing in Ukraine and have been seeing in Ukraine might amount to international crimes? Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the key legal questions around cyber operations and whether they would amount to an international crime is the threshold issue and the threshold of an attack. And there still remains sort of significant disagreement on what that threshold would be to trigger an armed conflict. However, there's a significant amount of consensus around the fact that during an armed conflict, cyber operations could amount to a war crime. Um, and we've seen the UN General Assembly, Assembly affirm the report um, by a group of governmental experts in 2015 saying that much. The International Committee of the Red Cross has also sort of affirmed the application of international humanitarian law to military cyber operations during an armed conflict. And most recently, the Council of Advisors report, an initiative I know uh, the Promise Institute was involved in, led by the permanent mission of Liechtenstein to the UN, um, has put out a report where they really deal with the Rome Statute specifically and how that applies to military uh, cyber operations. And again, there's a finding that existing law covers the cyber domain. Um, so then the issue becomes the nexus between sort of the cyber operations and the armed conflict, which in the case of Ukraine, 
I think is quite easy to make. If you look at Russian military doctrine, um, going back several years, um, looking at the organization of how the military and intelligence agencies dealing in cyber operations are organized, um, reviewing government statements, plans, policies, it's very clear that to the Russian government, to Putin, the information domain and the cyber domain are equally, if not more important than the other domains of warfare. And it is something very much that this hybrid war strategy is being executed in coordination. Um, so the cyber operations that are ongoing now and have started back as far back as 2014, um, have been very much a part of his strategy in Ukraine. Um, not all cyber operations necessarily are going to amount to an international crime. And there is sort of a separation between the information technology related cyber operations and the operational technology related cyber operations. And it's that second one where um, attacks on critical infrastructure, on systems that, have, that are attached to kinetic processes, um, like supplying power and distributing power, um, really, I think, do amount to international crimes. And over the last year, the Human Rights Center has been building cases, again, going back to 2014 and in the context of what's happen happened in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, where there are a few incidents we believe do meet the threshold because of the physical results um, in targeting of critical infrastructure, and particularly taking out a power grid, power that you know uh, supplies power to heating during the winter, traffic lights for public safety, um, hospitals, uh, heart monitors, you know, a lot of key critical services run on that power. So taking out a power grid can have significant effects. Um, and so now with what's going on, we're looking uh, quite critically and putting, pulling together a monitoring effort to see if any further crimes are committed, because I do think that's a big risk and I'm quite concerned about critical infrastructure and using cyber operations um, yeah, to target uh, these areas. So I'll maybe leave the question there, but uh, happy to answer other questions on the issue. What do you think the prospects are of the, so the International Criminal Court prosecutor, as I said at the outset, has yesterday announced uh, that he is going to ask for permission to open an investigation. What do you think the prospects are of him considering cyber operations in his investigation? Yeah, well, I'm hoping that once we submit all the evidence we have to him, he will be convinced that um, there are incidents worth pursuing in an investigation. And I think there are many benefits to this. Um, while some people might say cyber attacks aren't as significant as the shelling on the ground, cluster munitions where people are killed and injured, um, there are benefits to having what might be a simpler and tighter case where you can achieve accountability against the same actors in a shorter period of time. Um, because critical infrastructure is so important to so many different countries after the attacks in Ukraine. The information was quite widely spread. The Ukrainian government and uh, services who investigated it were quite open with what happened in the attack in order to improve defenses for all countries in the future. Um, there are significant expert reports which were developed not in anticipation of litigation, but um, you know, for the purposes of cyber defense. So I think they're a very reliable source. Um, so you would have a case that would involve a lot more documentary evidence and expert witnesses. So while the technical as aspects of it might make it a harder case to try, um, there are also some benefits to trying the case. Um, and it could be done, it could end up being a case that's maybe more feasible given the resource limitations of the prosecutor's office. And personally, I also feel, you know, this is 
Over the course of the pandemic, we've seen a 45% increase in attacks, cyber attacks on hospitals. Um, you know, the escalation of risk to civilian population, especially as our society becomes even more connected with the internet of things um, across the world, civilians are very, very vulnerable. So there's also just an important factor in sort of setting precedent and establishing some governing law in this area, which the states have sort of been derelict in their duty to actually come out and say that they're not going to attack critical infrastructure. Um, and so I think for the court, which is, you know, always trying to stay relevant, it would be an incredible step um, for the prosecutor to consider looking at cyber attacks as part of their investigations. I kind of think an essential step for dealing with the future of warfare as it's coming up. So I don't have an answer on what he'll do, but I have an answer on what I hope you will do once he sees the evidence we share with him. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. So I wanted to, I mean, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, but I wanted to come back to a topic which I think I know, Wayne, you're involved with efforts to try and preserve and collect evidence what's, uh, the, uh, you know, of what's going on on the ground. And I know, Lindsay, you're also um, are engaged in trying to, you know, deal with the digital evidence that's being, that's being preserved. But Wayne, could you tell us a little bit about the, um, the efforts you're involved in and in trying, to, trying to gather evidence of what's going on right now? Yeah, um, well, my organization has been involved um, since 2015, working with the prosecution uh, office in, in Ukraine and working with civil society, uh, helping them to document the crimes in Crimea and the crimes in the East. Um, there's a very active civil society um, in Ukraine, which is um, which has become very skillful, I would say, at um, documentation. Is about they've had eight years of um, practice, and the prosecutor general's office is very motivated. Um, even if um, it's only relatively recently that they've um, had to wrestle with these types of crimes. So at the moment, um, well, prior to this invasion, um, that's what my organisation was doing was um, helping. Uh, to build capacity of uh, both civil society and the prosecution, and also working with them uh, and focus, this was our focus, was uh, working with them to actually make submissions to the International Criminal Court uh, and to try to help them to gather evidence for domestic um, uh, uh, trials, um, if, if possible. Of course, very, very difficult because uh, Ukraine doesn't have access to Crimea, um, it doesn't have access to the east, and so, and of course doesn't have access to most of the suspects, so much of the work that we've been doing together has been with a with a, the long-term view that perhaps uh, one day when uh, the political situation changes in Russia, then uh, Ukraine can get hold of the suspects and the ICC can get hold of the suspects and vi viable trials can be had. Now, um, the situation obviously has changed significantly. The prosecution are still working in Kiev. Civil society and the, have formed a coalition, which is now uh, trying, uh, they're, they're scattered around the country, and they're trying to continue to document in this very new situation. Um, and I say very new because the scale is just so much more significant, and the difficulties of trying to organize uh, the, the, between the prosecution, civil society and international experts, all of whom are essential to success in this venture, um, is very, very difficult. So my job at the moment, and this is one of the reasons I'm staying in Ukraine, is to try to help that process, um, to try and work out a coordination mechanism which will ensure that um, civil society that's working now, but also in in the future, any civilians who are documenting uh, are able to document to international standards and preserve evidence and ensure that it gets to a centralized database, probably run by the prosecution, um, and thereafter is analyzed and then gets to um, international mechanisms always preserved for the future. 
Um, a, a very, very, very difficult um, task given the scale of the, um, the violations and the fact that it's happening during uh, the, the hottest part of the conflict. Yeah, absolutely. Lindsay, how does that relate to efforts you're involved in to capture digital evidence? I mean, we're seeing a lot of stuff on social media about what's happening right now, of course. Is it likely that that can be used in court? What efforts are underway to preserve or authenticate that? Yeah, well, there's a huge mobilization effort underway to coordinate between Ukrainian NGOs and international NGOs and the greater OSINT community who want to help out um, in really having a coordinated response to being able to preserve relevant content um, in a manner that uh, can make it admissible in the future. Um, and so that's been exciting to kind of see just based on the last year where we've had several rapid response events from the January 6th insurrection to the coup in Myanmar to the exit from Afghanistan to now, I think there's been significant improvement in having set up the infrastructure and databases to intake large volumes of digital evidence um, to kind of set up these monitoring efforts and coordinating between organizations. Um, so I think there's great improvement uh, the concern is that this information environment is nothing like we've ever seen before. It's just on another level, given the amount of technology and documentation going on within Ukraine and the sophistication of the sort of information warfare disinformation realm. And the verification part of this is really going to be a great challenge in sorting through everything that's out there and trying to find the truth sort of in the fog that is intentionally created, um, you know, by parties to the conflict, by other stakeholders. It's also just a messy thing because, you know, everyone's in the mix of contributing <laughs> to the information environment, some of it being extremely helpful and some of it being counterproductive. Um, and then finally, uh, in December 2020, the Human Rights Center and the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights published the Berkeley Protocol on Digital Open Source Investigations, um, which is a set of international standards. And the goal with that was really to provide guidance to civil society um, or lawyers just working outside of the ICC and other courts on the procedures that they would need to collect and preserve and verify online content in a way that would be sort of consistent with what the ICC prosecutor's office would do and that would sort of ensure maximize its admissibility in court. And I actually just heard that even though we haven't had the official translations published yet um, in UN languages that uh, Ukrainian groups have already been translating large portions of it into Ukrainian and Russian. So that was really good news to hear. And we have done several trainings for uh, Ukrainian NGOs on the Berkeley Protocol. So the hope is that that will be um, a useful resource um, as we deal with this sort of crazy information environment going forward. Thanks, Lindsay. And I'm just remembering that I meant to mention that Wayne's referred to his organisation as the founding partner of Global Rights uh, Compliance. Um, Richard, I have a couple of questions maybe you would like to take. Um, one is from Chandra Khan and asks, will the criminal court be able to take, I think the International Criminal Court, be able to take action against Putin since Russia is not a member state? And I also have a question about why allegations of genocide have not been included uh, in the ICC prosecutor's statement, uh, allegations of genocide against Russia, I mean, in Ukraine. So uh, maybe you'd like to take those too? Sure. Yeah. Thanks very much, Kate. It, it, it's fascinating listening to both Wayne and Lindsay's comments uh, in terms of efforts at evidence gathering. Um, and I'll add a thought there at the end. Um, indeed, um, the ICC prosecutor uh, hypothetically has jurisdiction 
under the Rome Statute of the ICC uh, against any individual responsible for the commission of war crimes or crimes against humanity, I'll get to genocide in a moment, um, as defined by um, Article 7 and Article 8 uh, of the Rome Statute. Um, there is another very important provision, Article 27 of the same statute um, that uh, enumerates the irrelevance of official position in investigation and prosecution, meaning therefore that Vladimir Putin, um, his uh, Minister of Defense, senior generals, other civilian officials could potentially be suspects. The jurisdictional basis for this is contained in Article 12 of the Rome Statute. And while Ukraine is not a state party, and I would hope uh, Ukraine would soon ratify uh, the Rome Statute, it did accept the jurisdiction of the court uh, over crimes committed on its territories. It did that, I believe it was September 8th, 2015. By virtue of that acceptance, the prosecutor has that lawful authority uh, to charge individuals responsible for the commission of Rome statute crimes in the Ukraine, including Vladimir Putin. Now, I would expect Vladimir Putin would have uh, a different view on that, but that is rooted in a very fundamental principle of jurisdiction known as territoriality. The crimes happened on Ukraine's uh, territory and the Ukraine delegated its responsibility to the International Criminal Court through its acceptance of jurisdiction. Uh, I think legally that is a sound basis for the prosecutor uh, to go forward. Um, in terms of the allegations of genocide, uh, I think it has to be noted that genocide is a very difficult crime to uh, charge and obtain conviction on because of the specific intent requirement included in the definition itself. What I mean by that is the prosecutor would have to prove an intent on the part of individuals in Russia uh, to eliminate in whole or in part uh, the people of Ukraine based on their ethnicity or nationality. Um, uh, that has proven to be a difficult evidentiary hurdle to get over. Uh, many alternative explanations can be cited for atrocity crimes other than an attempt to eliminate uh, a people. I think we'll have to see what the investigation yields uh, in terms of prospects for that inclusion of genocide. And finally, while we've rightly focused on the International Criminal Court, I do not think we want to ignore the national prosecutors of so many European countries who have the law to be able to prosecute jurisdiction crimes committed in Ukraine uh, that are violations of their domestic law, be it genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. And I would hope, uh, Wayne, you might have a word with those individuals at the European Union Genocide Network as another potential source 
for information uh, and evidence uh, uh, you and your colleagues generate. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I, I'm going to take, I, if there's any more questions in the room, please uh, let me know now, because we have a hard stop at uh, 1.15. I know the panelists have to run. I have one question that perhaps you can address, Wayne, I don't know, but it's an interesting question. We already talked about the situation of the border, you know, the very positive news that Ukrainians are generally being accepted, or at least white Ukrainians are being accepted, but the very disturbing news that, you know, non-Europeans who are in Ukraine, especially black and brown ones, are being refused entry. I have a question about um, whether there are any cases of countries refusing Ukrainian asylum seekers under the exclusive COVID-19 fears. And I don't know if anybody has any information on that. Is that anything you've heard about, Wayne? Actually, I, I haven't heard that. I mean, I have heard, obviously, a lot about uh, people of colour being refused entry into Poland, I think, and also Romania. Um, and I actually, um, I'm, I'm quite annoyed about it because it's often painted in the media as if that's um, a, a Ukrainian uh, problem, and it's not, as far as I can tell. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of a, a Poland and Romania problem. But I, I haven't heard the COVID uh, excuse. Um, I've heard the, uh, you don't live in Europe, uh, you're not coming through uh, excuse. Masked at times as well, it's women and children and men can't come through. Um, I've heard that, but not the COVID excuse. Okay, thank you. Well, then um, I'll, I'll just leave it to if anybody wants to have a last word uh, before we wrap up. Uh, Wayne, I don't know if you would like to just give us a last, I, a last thoughts. Yeah, mate. If I can, just to, just to pick up on uh, what Richard said, and I think this it's really important to 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 recognise the limitations of the International Criminal Court. I think um, the, the 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 immediate future we should be focusing on uh, universal jurisdiction and the um, ability of national courts within Europe, particularly, to pick up these cases and try to um, investigate and prosecute. Uh, Putin's cronies. The ICC uh, prosecutor announced yesterday that they're going to move to um, apply for a full investigation. Lithuania has uh, referred, as I understand it, joined in by Canada, uh, referred um, the Ukraine to um, the um, ICC, which means that authorization from the pretrial chamber is not required. But nonetheless, um, you're looking at an ICC prosecutor who's got a fraction of the resources that he needs to be able to do uh, the job at hand. And I, when I say fraction, my estimation is he's probably got no more than about 20% of the resources he needs to prosecute all the situations and all the investigations that are opened. And you've got an assembly of state parties who do not seem willing to open their wallets and put money into the ICC. So with the best will in the world to investigate what's going on in Ukraine, even before this invasion, you need an army of investigators and an army of prosecutors. Um, with the current invasion, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to do a decent job in this country without um, a real proper investigation team. And I'm talking about 30 or 40 or 50 investigators. Uh, did, the prosecution at the ICC are unlikely to have more than 10 to work on this uh, conflict. The last time I checked, they had one uh, Russian speaker and one Ukrainian speaker in their whole prosecution team. So I don't think we should put much faith in the ICC, unfortunately, certainly not in the short term. Thanks for that. I think that's Sorry a, to leave that on that pessimistic note. <laughs> I think it was going to be hard to leave this particular conversation on an optimistic note. But let me thank you all very, very much for your time. Thanks for everyone who joined us online. Thanks yeah. for the students for attending and uh, all the best to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.